All right, good morning, everyone. It's 10.03. Thank you all so much for joining us for our monthly coffee and conversation. We've been doing these monthly. Uh, normally, we've been doing them uh, at libraries and coffee shops and diners, uh, but unfortunately, circumstances are such that we need to do these electronically, but uh, this works well. So I'm glad everyone could take some time out. I hope everyone is safe and well. Um, even though the weather is nice and we're starting to open up a bit, um, you know, let's please remember the basics, masks, either a cloth mask or a paper mask. Um, let's stay safe uh, and, and let's do this right. It, you know, I, I think we've got kind of one opportunity to get this right. So hope everyone is being careful, uh, social distancing, using masks uh, as we begin to, to open up. Couple quick ground rules. Um, uh, we can talk about anything you want. I'll start with a few opening remarks. I, I see my my friend and colleague, uh, Assemblywoman Sandy Galef here, so we'll give her the floor for a few minutes, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. We can talk about anything you want to talk about. Our only rule, no yelling. Let's be respectful of each other. Um, you know, we've really worked hard to try and change the tone of the conversation, uh, and and you know, I'm very proud of the people in the Hudson Valley for how we've conducted ourselves. Also, um, on the chat side, we're gonna be talking about some links and some numbers. Uh, Tanner will be typing them in on the chat side. Um, and when it comes time to questions, there's a hand raising feature. Um, I believe that is, where, where's the chat feature for folks? If the hand raising feature. If you go on participants, you can raise your hand. You're on mute, Tanner. Was I muted? Could you hear me now? All right. You can hear me now? No, okay. I can't. All right. <laughs> there, there's a hand raising feature that you press the hand raise and then Ben or Tanner will call on you to uh, ask your question. And, and so we'll keep folks muted just to keep background noise down. Um, but, but then we'll get to all the questions or you can type them into the chat feature e either way. Um, with that said, the first number I, I want to give you all is our office number 914-241-4600. If you have any needs at all, uh, please call. Um, we have been flooded with, um, complaints about the Department of Labor website, unemployment claims, unemployment in New York is currently 14.5%. Um, our team has been working seven days a week. Uh, we're close to 500 cases. I think, I think this week we'll, we'll pass 500 cases. The Department of Labor website was in no way, shape or form prepared for the volume. Uh, there are over 1.5 million claims now in New York State for unemployment benefits. Um, so we've been working very, very uh, intensely with folks to try to get them the benefits that they're entitled to. So if you need help, feel free to call. Uh, the other issue we've been dealing with a lot is food insecurity. Um, people who have never necessarily needed assistance from a food pantry, um, perhaps maybe they even used to donate to a food pantry, are now um, needing food assistance. So if you need, a, if you need food, um, or assistance, you can dial 211 to find out um, the nearest location near you. We've also been very busy um, in, in collecting food. We've done two food drives. Uh, we did one in um, Sleepy Hollow. We did one in Peekskill. We've supported food drives in uh, Brewster um, and in Putnam County. We've given away food uh, in Brewster and in North Salem. Our next food drive um, will be next Sunday in Peekskill, uh, excuse me, in Mount Kisco at Mount Kisco Elementary School. So we'll be looking for dry goods, beans, pasta, rice, canned goods, um, shelf-stable milk, things like that. So any, anything that you can do to be of assistance would be greatly uh, of, of help. Um, we also have received a number of calls for PPE. Uh, if you're an individual and you need masks or disinfectant, call the office. We're, we're happy to help. Uh, if you're an organization, the chain of command 
is to go through your county's uh, Office of Emergency Management, make the request with them, and then call us, and we will get involved and see if we can expedite that. And we've done that for first responders, for nursing homes, um, and, and we're happy, happy to help. Um, on the small business side, um, we've received a lot of calls from small businesses. Um, the, the Small Business Administration, SBA.gov, uh, stepped in. There was a federal PPP program. Uh, the first um, was oversubscribed. The second um, round of funding, there is, there is still some funding available for small businesses. The good news is um, the governor yesterday announced $100 million in state funding for small businesses. And, and this is good news because this is essentially legislation that I was carrying. Um, so it's $100 million for small business and nonprofits with fewer than 20 employees, uh, less than 3 million in revenues, and have not received uh, any uh, small business administration assistance. So, you know, at this point, it doesn't matter whether we pass it legislatively or the governor does it through executive action. The point is we got it done, um, so there's more assistance. Um, the good news, we are close to opening the Mid-Hudson region. Uh, my district, Westchester, Putnam, and Dutchess are all in the Mid-Hudson region. As long as the epidemiological criteria keep trending down over the next few, few days, we will be able to start phase one of opening. Um, Phase one would be uh, construction, agriculture, wholesale, um, and curbside retail. Uh, then about two weeks later, phase two would be professional services, all of retail and real estate. Two weeks after that, phase three, restaurants and hotels, and then phase four, arts, entertainment, recreation. Education is phase four right now. Schools are closed through the end of the year and they're closed for summer school, but they are still doing um, uh, tele-education uh, and they're responsible for that for summer school as well. I wish you, I could give you some guidance on colleges um, for New York for the fall. Those decisions have not been made. Uh, there's a task force looking at that issue, how students can, can get to college. Um, the president of PACE is, is on that task force. So we've, we've been talking about that. So we just don't have that news quite yet. Um, give you a little bit of what, what else we've been working on. Um, as you know, I chair the Committee on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse, founding co-chair of our task force on opioids, uh, addiction, and overdose prevention. Um, the system is, is very badly strained. Um, I've had Zoom meetings with a number of the providers um, and agencies recommending their providers. The whole behavioral health spectrum, mental health, co-occurring disorders, substance use disorders. That's why I'm strongly backing um, their request for $38.5 billion in the next federal stimulus um, for the whole behavioral health spectrum. Um, they, as I said, they're under stress. There is much more demand. Um, the Kaiser Family Foundation is predicting another 75,000 deaths. They're calling them death of despair from people self-medicating, alcohol use, and opioids. So it's critical we get that money. Um, we are going back into session this week. In fact, I'm going up to Albany Monday night. Um, and, and Sandy can maybe touch on this too. Um, got a couple bills that... that um, I'm, I'm still pushing hard. As you know, Indian Point is, is being decommissioned. The first reactor was shut down last month. Um, that was a big challenge for that community to begin with. And then you throw the COVID crisis on top of that. Um, so Buchanan, uh, the town of Cortland, the folks who work there. Uh, so Sandy and I are working very hard in partnership. We've got three bills, one to protect the workers, uh, the other to protect the revenue from the municipalities and the school district, and the third to create an oversight board to see that it is done safely. So in the CLP CPA, we talk a lot about a just transition 
Um, Indian Point is really the poster child in the state for that. And we're working very hard on that. The final thing I, I want to mention is the budget situation. You've heard about the deficit. The budget office has identified a $3.6 billion shortfall currently. Uh, unlike the federal government, New York State cannot run a deficit. Um, we have to have a balanced budget by law. So unless we get federal relief, um, we will have to make $13.6 billion in adjustments. And by adjustments, essentially that means cuts. So what we need to do is, is we need to continue to lobby um, our federal partners um, for, for federal assistance. It sounds like the Senate is becoming more open to negotiating with the House on the package that they passed, um, but it's really critical for both states, counties, and local municipalities. Expenditures have gone up, revenues have gone down, and all of our levels of government are currently experiencing um, uh, deficits right now. So that's why it's so critical. So before we open it up to um, uh, questions, um, Tom, if, or Ben, if you could unmute Sandy, um, I'd like to give Assemblywoman Sandy Galef a moment uh, to just say a few words as well. Sandy, hi. hi. I just got unmuted. Great. I'm still learning this, Pete. Uh, it's I can't hear you. Um, you should be able to hear me. I'm ben, unmuted. Is she muted? No, I, everybody can hear me but you. I think that's what yeah. happened with Tanner, too. All right, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I hear her. Okay. okay. All right. Um, actually, this is the first time I really um, have had a chance to to talk uh, with with Pete, uh, other than on email and by telephone. Uh, <laughs> nobody's seen anybody, so. Uh, but he gave a very thorough report of what we're doing, and the assembly is also going back. Um, I just, you know, like to say that um, our offices get so many emails these days, so many phone calls people crying on the phone, most of it is about unemployment. Um, and so those are the issues that have kind of taken over the day, I would say, in our offices. Um, but we want to be sure that people know that they can call us to try to get that help. And things are opening up, unemployment, I think, uh, I think maybe have a better plan now. They keep trying to change it. They didn't know, you know, millions of people would be in this situation. So it's getting better. But we also have some issues. This week I had one about somebody trying to get married at one of our local country clubs and, and not being able to change dates and losing a lot of money um, because they can't, except the facility can't have a ga gathering of 75 people. So it's kind of a business issue that, that we're dealing with. Uh, there are parents um, writing to us saying, we'd really like to get learners permits for our kids because this is a good time. We don't have as much going on. We could you know, get our children to learn to drive. That hasn't opened up yet. Maybe the DMV will allow them to take uh, a course, uh, their, their course online. Um, we've had some issues with library construction because libraries have gotten grants from the state of New York, but they have to have all the work done by the end of June and they can't do it because people can't, you know, we've had limitations on construction. So those are some of the other issues that uh, we don't think about every day, but um, certainly my constituents do. Uh, I don't know whether you voted on the mask contest um, you know, I, I watched the five, um, five different mask promos that was on one of the governor's uh, press conferences. So be sure to do it this weekend. Um, you know, we're trying to be sure, as Pete said, when we get back into this and we start to open up, the masks are an absolute must and we got to get people to recognize that. Um, just a, another aside, um, the Croton Gorge, which was a big issue in my district and overcrowding for the last number of years, I just want you all to know that it's been closed down from Memorial Day to Labor Day uh, because there's no way to do social distancing at the Croton Gorge. Um, there are just so many people there now. 
uh, it would become uh, intolerable. And just, you know, reflection on some of the things that are changing. The NRC was going to have meetings um, about Indian Point and um, inspections and everything else, and they have postponed those to the fall. And hopefully in the fall, we'll be able to do more indirect meetings uh, or direct meetings instead of just webcasts. So those are some of the things going on, and I look forward to listening to what you're talking about. And be sure to call our offices um, anytime, any place, uh, or email us with any issues that um, any you know any of you are addressing. So thank you so much, and have a good Memorial Day weekend. It's a little different, not going to parades and memorial ceremonies and uh, staying home, but uh, let's put our flags outside and, and wave them and uh, pay tribute to those who have served us uh, in this country so well for so many years and in so many battles. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. That was terrific. Um, so we'll begin now. Um, ben, you'll, you'll select the questioners. All right. Yeah, uh, first one up is uh, Kenneth. Uh, unmute him uh, now and oh thank you uh, there you are uh, Sandy thank, thank you uh, if people would, could also say what town they're from that would be helpful I'm sorry Kenneth go ahead sure Kent uh, in Yorktown and uh, the thing that Sandy brought up I thought was interesting because it addresses a lot of park issues access like Croton Gorge and I could see the overcrowding could very easily happen uh, I see what's going on with the uh, breakneck trails. They're getting mobbed. They have to close them. I'm wondering, and I don't expect it to happen tomorrow, if we could maybe devise some kind of reservation system, uh, not overly policed with some spot checks with maybe a ranger to make sure that it's being adhered to, uh, volunteer to, maybe get volunteers. When you volunteer, you're outside, and I'm outside a lot. But I'm careful, you know, the mask, etc. And also, if you need any assistance in this area, because I am concerned about reopening, but reopening without getting in trouble again with the pandemic, other things. So I just, that's it. I'm all set. Thanks. Thank you. That, that was a good point. Thank you. We will talk to both the county executive um, regarding the county parks and, and the governor's office. Sandy and I are on a call with the governor's office every day um, at, at 5.30, and, and it's a really good working relationship. So we'll, we'll bring those points up. Uh, Sandy, Sandy wanted to chime in. We'll unmute her for a sec. Uh, we actually, that, that's such a good point. We had had a meeting um, so, uh, last year at about this time to try to figure out a plan for the Croton Gorge. And um, am I unmuted? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we were um, going to do exactly what you said, have kind of a reservation system. So you go up on an, on an internet and you reserve a spot for the Croton Gorge or whatever. And they've done this in one other park in the state of New York seems to be working well. It limits the number of cars that you have, so you don't have the neighbors all upset with all the cars that are coming. Uh, but it also limits the number of people that are on the site. And of course, with Croton Gorge, it's, it's a site that could so easily be trampled and destroyed if we don't put some kind of limitations on it. And of course, in the Hudson Highlands, um, also they have closed down the trails because as you said, there were too many people there, but we need, um, and we've had guides that remind people how to um, travel safely, what kind of clothing to wear. I mean, there are people still that go in, in improper shoes in, you know, on, on some of these missions up the mountain. So, um, you know, I think what you're saying, we will try to get into effect, but right now there isn't time to do it. And the really, the social distancing in that area is very, very hard. Large families come. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, uh, Julie. Should be, let's see. Okay. Can you hear me? Hi there. Hi. Can you hear me? Sure can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Julie. I'm uh, from Yorktown. Um, 
I had uh, just a couple of questions I was on last time with you. So hopefully I, I kind of got sh cut short last time. <clears throat> so please don't cut me off this time. Um, I'm retired from law enforcement a year ago. Um, I don't like the way our state's going with our freedoms that I see going on. And I wanted to see if you were able to answer two questions that I had for you at the last meeting. One you didn't have an answer for was uh, Governor Cuomo's um, involvement in getting involved with medical decisions on the disbursement of hydroxychloroquine, which should be, to be between a doctor and a patient. But he has set executive orders now not allowing to doctors, and I've spoken with multiple doctors, that are taking it prophylactically for themselves. So there's studies on both sides. Um, I know the studies haven't been great for when it's given at late stages for um, COVID, but there have been very much positive studies for giving it prophylactically or early stages. So I'd like to know why the governor is getting involved with um, medical decisions when it should be between a doctor and patient. And if that's something you could answer, that's first part. And the second question part of it is, um, regarding your, um, your stand on the forced vaccination um, in respect to COVID uh, for, and uh, most vaccines take about five years for safety and efficacy. Um, coronavirus vaccines uh, have proven to be dangerous um, when tried before, that they actually cause more severe consequences when somebody is given that vaccine and then exposed to the virus uh, they actually get sicker and has actually been proven with cases like the swine flu and RSV when they have rushed out these vaccines. So those are the two things that, um, and of course, our freedoms being violated for opening up the state. We have flattened the curve. The state should be opened. Um, it just seems like more and more criteria are being added. Um, it's violating people's freedoms. Now that the hospitals are not overwhelmed anymore, the state should be opened. And it's, I'm, me I'm medically compromised, so I choose to stay home, but that should be everybody's given right. So. Can you tell me where you stand with that? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the short answer is for both. Um, you've got to ask the governor why he does what he does. I don't, I don't speak with, for the governor. Um, you know, I have always believed that medical decisions should be made between a doctor and a patient. And, and you know, the, the more politicians get involved, the more complicated that gets. So, so it should be between a doctor and a patient. Um, the second is there, there is no vaccine right now. Um, there, there is no plan to force vaccines right now. The Senate and the assembly have no um, plans uh, to vote on anything right now because there is not anything. So let's see what the medical community comes up with. Let's see what plan they recommend. And, and then we can talk about it. We could be, as you said, we could be a year, we could be five years. You know, we, we just don't know. So that, that is not something that's on the legislative radar right now. Next is uh, uh, Robert, coming up. Hi, good morning. Good morning. This is Robert from Croton on Hudson. Um, I'm happy I was able to partake today. Thank you. Thanks um, for my, my questions are, um, there are many, but my focus today is related to the developmental disability community and special yep. education. Yep. Um, I have a, I, the governor has closed summer school. Um, now, when we say summer school, most people consider that um, for the general education students. For special education students, in the developmental disability community, it's a lot more than quote unquote summer school. It's an extended school year and it's a critical service. With the remote learning that's been occurring for some time now, the children with the most significant needs that have individualized education plans that are mandated by law and regulation to be carried out, they really can't happen remotely. Um, it's a general statement, yes, but for those with the more significant needs, of which my son is one, if he could learn remotely, he wouldn't have an IEP. So mm -hmm. I don't discredit the great efforts of the teachers in the schools. Uh, his teacher happens to be phenomenal, but it's just not happening. Um, so he's really not going to progress. And to extend that to the summer session now, um, is really not a good choice. And I had reached out, um, and Sandy was kind enough to respond to me. 
to find out if any of the Reimagine Education Council that the governor appointed um, had any experience with special education. And apparently a, a few do. I hope that there is enough involved there to really consider this. Um, my son can, attends a residential school, which is a whole nother set of issues and a lot more complications. And unfortunately, in the midst of all of this, the special education community and the developmental disability communities particularly are not getting the support the attention that they need and deserve um they're not dissimilar to nursing homes and when it comes to a congregate care setting with the needs and the uh, testing that we're trying to get funded by the state for their employees uh, i'm trying to be as quick and concise yeah, as you, i can you know, robert this. it's it's interesting and thank you for bringing this up because we um, in fact, this last week on our evening calls with the, the governor's office, talked about this a great deal. Um, and, and Tom Abenanti, uh, Assemblyman Tom Abenanti is, is a great champion on this issue and, and raised this very passionately um, that, that special ed um, students and, and, and students with um, developmental disabilities need the personal attention. They, they need to be with other human beings in order to progress in their education. We've also been really vigilant of pressing with them on the need for PPE, for group homes, for testing. Um, in fact, our office has been helpful in getting PPE for some facilities. Um, so so the, the issues you raise um, are, are very important. Um, and, and Sandy and I have been, have been dealing with that. And just this last week, in fact, we had rather lengthy conversations with the governor's office about this. So we'll keep pressing. Uh, next, uh, Katie Weissman. Katie? It looks like She's muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? There we go. Hi, Katie. Hi, sorry. Um, so I'm from Mount Kisco. Um, I have four issues, so I'll be as fast as I can on each of them. Um, and I agree with Julie and Robert on both of what they just commented on. Um, I have a young adult son with autism. And one of the things I wanted to draw to both of your attention is that the res respite is not currently being allowed to, through the OPWDD system. They're not allowing any billing. And I'm really concerned, particularly about Spark, which is in Yorktown, which has been, you know, a leader in the recreational and, you know, keeping our kids occupied productively, getting them out in the community for about 20 years now. I'm not sure these nonprofit agencies are going to be around if we don't allow them to open up and to bill for respite. And, you know, these programs, they're very, they're few and far between to begin with. They're not easily replaceable, and their staff can only go so long, you know, furloughed out. I will, we'll look into that. We're happy to. Okay. Um, second thing I wanted to just mention, the question of churches reopening. I know that there's the religious and it's too big a crowd issues and that sort of thing, but I wanted to point out um, one of Don's other programs actually runs in a church in White Plains. They could socially distance. The group is only typically eight to 10 kids and they have a big enough room. And then they go out in the community from there. But as long as the churches stay closed, they don't have access to that space. I also wanted to point out here in Kisco. Um, Religious services of eight to uh, up to 10 people are open. So if they're, if, they're only, if they're only 10 students, they can do it. Okay, but the, I don't know that the church is open. Yeah, they to are. The, they are. Okay. Okay, um, the second thing though I wanted to point out is when you were talking about substance abuse, things like Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, food pantries, you know, there are other things that go on in churches beyond just religious services and we need to be cognizant of that. Um, the third issue I wanted to bring up is um, I've been writing articles about vitamin D and COVID. The research is building rapidly. We now have 14 clinical trials around the world looking at vitamin D, including one that just opened up. There's Alberta, there's California, there's Louisiana. And they're seeing really big, really significant impact on the severity of COVID in people who are vitamin D deficient. I've been trying, I've called the County Board of Health, I've called New York State DOH. They took three weeks to get back to me and I got someone from the tobacco division 
who said she passed the information on. I don't know if it happened. I've tried calling um, the governor's office. I'm having trouble getting this information to people who can do something with it. There is research on this. All right, you know I what? Think that if, can I get that to you? And yeah, you get it to me? us and we'll get it. So, so Tanner is going to type in my email address in the chat side. Okay. Harkham, Harkham at nysenate.gov. Okay. Yeah. I'm, like I said, I'm just, I know that you guys are overwhelmed with email. It's just, this is something that could actually protect us. No, we're, we're happy. We're happy. To, thank you. Okay. And then the last one is libraries. They yep. haven't, and you mentioned that earlier with the construction piece of it. Um, my mother happens to live in Canada and her library has been doing through all of this pick up and drop off service, just like the restaurants are doing. We have reservation systems already in place in Westchester County. It would be great if we could open our libraries to the extent of letting people reserve and then pick up things so we don't have to have them in and out of the building. Yeah, um, that would be a huge help for homeschooling parents and also for people who um, just need to entertain their troops. They can get videos, DVDs for their kids once school ends, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, li libraries, actually, we've been discussing a lot lately, Libraries are not technically closed because they're considered government buildings. The question is staffing. What, what are considered essential staffing? But libraries are technically open. Ben? All right, uh, Jennifer, you're, uh, you're ready. Let's see. Working. Hi, how are you guys? Hey, Jennifer. How Good are you? you? Doing well, doing well. Good. So, I, should, I should tell folks Jennifer is doing a fabulous job with the, the Putnam Business Council, um, you know, getting, getting folks ready to open uh, safely and effectively up there, doing a fabulous job. Thanks for joining thank, us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my question is on behalf of the Business Council, uh, twofold. Very curious. We went uh, in Putnam County from a position of having roughly having to have roughly 30 tracers to having to come up with 89 and um, You know because we're in the mid Hudson region and that's just how it, it went went down So number one, I'm wondering what happened to the state promise or the Bloomberg promise I don't really understand that whole thing. What what how it went down with the tracers? I just know at this point it's up to us to find them and so we're scrambling um, and then the second part of my question is, do you think we can try to get the guidelines for phase two, three, and four um, out a little bit sooner? The phase one guidelines almost came out at the same time that we were almost ready to open phase one. So um, I think that would give businesses something to focus on. The safety template is great, um, but it, it leaves a lot to question, so. Yeah. Um we we will we will ask about the tracers because you're absolutely right the governor said that the state would help recruit and train tracers so that should not fall solely to the county um and throughout the process the frustrating thing has been the guidelines whether it was what was were essential businesses um what were the exceptions all of these things the guidelines come after the pronouncements so I, I agree with you um, that it's um, uh, frustrating uh, on the guidelines and, and I, Sandy and I continue to push to get more clarity sooner. Ben? Ben looks frozen. I'm trying to get uh, Robert Martinez here. No, nope, I'm unmuting. Can you hear me? Unmute. Hello? Hi, this is Carmen yep, and Robert. Can you hear us? Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. This is Carmen and Robert. Um, we had a question regarding the, the forbearance, mortgage forbearance uh, period. They were saying 90 days, but yet mortgage companies want everything to lump sum at the end of the forbearance period. I had emailed your office and I received a response saying that really the, the delayed payments should be added to the end of the mortgage, basically extending the mortgage by the same time period if it's 90 days and add 90 days at the end. Um, however, the mortgage companies are not doing that. Is there going to be any kind of legislation to address it to force 
or or make these mortgage companies automatically change the mortgage end period without having to go through an expensive refinance. We 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 agree with you and we would like to see that. I know I know there is legislation in the Senate. Um, I, I don't know about the assembly. Maybe maybe Sandy can uh, address that. Um, but but we are looking at that in the Senate as part of our housing package. Herb is uh, Good morning. Hey, Herb, how are you? Peter, how are you? And Sandy, delight, delightful to see you. Good to see you, yeah. my friend. Thank you so much. I have a very unique question, and I apologize if it's too narrow. I am in an assisted living in Connecticut. My wife lives in our home in Somers. So is it the case that policy developed by Lamont in Connecticut could also apply to me here in in the Connecticut? Yeah, you you because you are residing in Connecticut, you would you would technically fall under the Connecticut rules. But if I wanted to execute it because of living in Somers or owning a home in Somers, would that work? Yeah, I think if if you know like we we just before the last questioner we spoke about the mortgage issues or things like that that would apply in new york since you're that's where the home you own is and then the the issues around you know personal activities in connecticut shopping haircuts things like that that would apply to you in connecticut All right, uh, next up, uh, Carla, uh, too. Uh, hi, I'm Carla Lucchino. I live in Brewster. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, the governor's executive orders. I would like a little better understanding about how those executive orders are created. I'm particularly interested in the role uh, that you play, or my assembly representative is Kevin Byrne. Uh, I'm interested in the role the Senate and the assembly play in having input and guiding those executive orders. Uh, I can understand in the beginning when we were in more of an emergency posture where the governor would just go ahead and make those executive orders, but now uh, there's plenty of guidance out there. Folks have adjusted to a bit of a new normal, although it's still changing. And I think as our representatives, you should have a say uh, so that we have a voice in those executive orders. I also think, uh, based on all the guidance that's out there, I agree with some of the previous opinions that we should open faster. We should observe safety protocols, but I think uh, people can determine the level of safety and risk that's acceptable for their businesses and individuals can determine if uh, those businesses are worth the risk uh, based on their levels of acceptance for safety. Carla, thank you for, for the question. Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have um, checks and balances on those per se, because they are executive orders. We don't vote on them in the legislature. What we do have is the power of persuasion. Um, and and Getting, getting clarity on things and getting things moving. For instance, um, some of us were very active on getting the equine business open. That was not scheduled to open. It was through, as you said, power of persuasion that we were able to do that. So, um, you know, unfortunately, this, this, these are not things that we in the legislature vote on, um, but we do, uh, we're in touch with the governor's office several times a day. And as issues come up, we advocate for those. You know, working with with um, with the Putnam County folks, we were trying to advocate um, because Putnam was further away from the epicenter. Putnam and Dutchess perhaps could open sooner than Westchester. That was something we were advocating for. We had a lot of conversations with the governor's office about. Ultimately, they decided to keep all the regions together. Um, fortunately, we're going to be opening this week. 
Um, but, but we are constantly in touch with them and, and passing along uh, the needs of the constituents. Like the gentleman before speaking about education and summer school and developmental disabilities. You know, we must have spoken for an hour about that with them. Um, I don't know whether it was Thursday or Wednesday, um, but, but so we have the power of persuasion. Unfortunately, we don't have the power to vote yay or nay on these things. All right, uh, Carol from uh, Carol's iPad. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of comments, questions. With regard to nursing homes, Right now, um, what happened in the past, that was a travesty. Now um, we're going to another extreme and putting undue pressure on nursing homes to test their staff twice a week, costing an undue expense to everybody. And there's no real accuracy or guideline of, you could test somebody Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, you know, we didn't protect these patients in the past. Now we're throwing money because of X, whatever it may be. Guilt, I did the wrong thing to begin with. We're burdening the nursing homes once again to get tested. And it's a, a tremendous expense on each home and our state. Yeah, we, we have been um, very vocal on the nursing home issue. Some constituent raised um, the issue very early on about um, patients who had been in a hospital who had tested positive being brought back to nursing homes. Um, so we've been very vocal with the administration about that issue. Um, I agree that nursing homes certainly need the same level of support that we've given hospitals um, if in terms of testing and PPE. Uh, in New Jersey, in fact, the National Guard was brought in to do the testing in New Jersey. So I think there's still more that we can do on nursing homes to provide relief. It's one thing to make the mandates, but where's the funding and, and the staffing power gonna come from? All right, now, uh, I know you wanted to speak with uh, Stephanie quickly, uh, so we'll unmute her first. Good morning, am I unmuted? Hi, Stephanie. Good morning. How are you? And how is everybody? So um, I have a nonprofit that um, addresses co-occurring disorders, mental health and substance misuse and addiction. A lot of our programming takes place with teens and young adults. I have been presenting, I've now had four presentations with Southern Westchester and Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES, where there have been between 80 and 90 school related participants in each one. My concern when we think about reimagine education is the long-term impact of COVID-19 on the behavioral health and wellness of our young people. Um, I'm, I also co-chair our co-occurring system of care committee for Westchester County, and I do work across the region. There's a really big concern about access to telehealth, how telehealth is working, um, the ability to continue telehealth once COVID-19 is over, but also looking to um, the summer, particularly with our teens and young adults, you know, things like Rye Playland are closed and the camps are closed. You're gonna have a lot of young people who are looking for things to do. And so I'm wondering how the Senate is going to look creatively at connecting the conversation because everybody's kind of worried about their own pot in this. My belief is that behavioral health and wellness is going to impact education on the academic level. And I'm concerned about how this is going to be looked at going forward. Um, I know you have been very committed to the co-occurring conversation. And I kind of believe that the time is right now to really look at behavioral health and wellness through one lens. And I'm wondering how we can kind of make that happen. I actually did, just so I can announce it to this group, I just found out this week we got our first big grant. And so the grant is to actually expand our prevention programming across the region and then to actually do the work with our providers. So I'd love to be able to work well and with everybody on that. Yeah, well, first of all, Stephanie, thank you for everything you're doing. You've been a real champion. Um, and, and it's great to see in just a short time, I've known you how, how your organization has grown and how you have changed the conversation. And it is about co occurring disorders and, and about the umbrella of behavioral health. 
And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm really pushing on the national level for this $38.5 billion that the Behavioral Health Coalition of 40 national agencies is calling for. You know, one of the things you mentioned, telehealth, um, this has been a huge cost to providers to have to buy the hardware and the tablets and things because some people don't have access to this. So it's been a massive infrastructure investment. Um, what, what we have heard is that for the folks who got up and running, they actually have higher compliance with, with, um, with sessions with their patients than they did face to face. So that, that's kind of the good news. The other bit of good news is that they have gotten waivers from Medicaid and from the state to do these sorts of things. Um, but what we need to do is get the waivers extended. So when finished, um, the things that are working that we found during the pandemic, we can continue with. Um, I agree with you um, 100% um, that, um, you know, this is going to have a big impact on our young people, you know, and it goes to the Kaiser Family Foundation report, among other things. So um, this is something that, that I'm obviously paying a lot of attention to. Um, we're, we're hearing also um, from providers and from community groups that overdoses are up across the state. I'm greatly concerned about that. We were over meeting with a bunch of EMS folks yesterday. They were telling us about um, the rise in, in overdoses locally. So we, we have a lot of work to do. The only thing I just want to add is the completed suicides as well. So SAMHSA just came out with a grant and it's a grant specifically to reduce completed suicides. I hope that when the New York State Senate, and, and I know um, Assemblyman Galef is in, um, that you start thinking of this not just as either overdose or suicide, it's really the end result. And so they're looked at comprehensively so that the budget lines and the grants don't just fall in one or the other because really they're related. Well, they, absolutely. And, and that's why um, the conversation about merging OMH and OASIS into one agency is picking up some steam because there never should be two funding streams. It should be one. They should be bundled because we're treating people holistically. Um, and, and we shouldn't have to say, all right, you can bill for this service here and this service there when it's the same individual. It, the funding should come from the same source. All right, next up, uh, I know we also to speak with Ms. Keegan. So, uh, you would unmute her, Tanner. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, I was really, really impressed by the last Stephanie who spoke. Um, I am, as many of you know, the mom of a veteran who died because of an addiction problem that he developed while he was suffering from PTSD and waiting for treatment from the VA. On, on another side, I'm also the current candidate um, in District 94 for State Assembly, but that's not why I'm here. I want to know how people who are just like normal citizens like I am right now, I'm a veterans advocate, how do I work with you to help you do the work that you're doing? Well, I, I think there, there are a couple ways. One is the state um, is still looking for volunteers, um, both on the behavioral health side and, and also in other areas. Um, so Tanner can put that up. Um, the second is we're always looking for partners in our community coalitions, arounding awareness, education, treatment prevention um would love to to get you involved in our networks you know there are great groups like stephanie's there's drug crisis in our backyard you know there's so many wonderful groups but they're never enough so um offline let, let's talk more okay. um but we'd love to get you involved and and thank you and thanks stephanie um both of you for your for your service anything i can do to help thank you all right, our uh, friend, uh, Greg Rivera. Uh, sure. Um, can you hear me, Senator? Yeah, sure can. How are you, Greg? I'm doing great and good to see you guys again. Um, good to see you. Just a general question I have. Um, we are expected to get a second wave of COVID eventually, whether it be in the fall or late summer. So I just want to ask you, um, 
as best as yet you can answer, what is the, can the state do and what can we as citizens do to better prepare for the second time around and the first time around? Especially since I'm a volunteer firefighter, that's something that, of course, um, I have had to deal with uh, quite um, regularly. That's a, that's a good question, you know, and, and the epidemiologists are predicting that there may be a second wave, perhaps in the fall or the winter, um, and we do need to be prepared. So we need to, um, first of all, better supply our hospitals with PPE and, and with, um, with ventilators. Uh, the governor's looking uh, to make sure everyone has a 90-day supply. Um, to the comment that the, the, the woman made earlier, we have to give better assistance to our nursing homes. Um, we've been working um, with our first responders on a number of occasions. They've needed PPE. Um, we're actually working with Westchester County to give them a grant um, to buy disinfecting machines for fire departments and, and EMS. Um, so through our, our grant process, we're trying to be of assistance um, but overall, we need to build capacity. Um, but on, on the front side, we need to, we need to slow um, the development of what may be a second wave by continuing to be smart, wearing masks, social distancing, washing hands, and avoiding big crowds. Thanks. All right, next up, uh, Wilfredo. Good morning, Senator. Good morning, uh, good morning brother. How are you? Very well, thank you. Very well, thank you, New York. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, again, for those who don't know me, I'm Wilfredo Morel, Hudson River Healthcare Director of Hispanic Health, and um, and of course a proud uh, member of this community here in Westchester, Peachkill, New York, to be more exact. Um, just briefly, our uh, Hudson River Healthcare has been diligently working with our community, especially our local government, providing the testing and, and also the education and all that. Um, in terms of question, in terms of uh, for you, um, it's number one is uh, you mentioned in reference to the budget, um, the, the funding that will come for small businesses. I just wanted to know whether there is a specific plan for small businesses who are owned by immigrants. And when I said immigrants, I'm talking about non-English speaking folks that involve everyone. The second is in the mental health piece. Uh, as we know, uh, as we know, our, our governor is completely looking at uh, the, the how you know COVID virus has infected uh, folks. In, the, in and substance use and all that, but one piece is, is there any also a specific uh, uh, approach for the essential workers, those who are working directly, providing the care, trying to maintain, to stay negative so that they will themselves be not contracted, but also what they are witnessing on a day-to-day -day basis, which are, again, essential, but unfortunately, it's, it's all about the aftermath. Continuing with that, I, uh, I would like to thank you both, Sandy and, and, and Pete, for helping the, uh, for uh, the AIDS Institute get basically a level funding for HIV and AIDS in our state. But last week um, um, at our uh, AIDS Council meeting, um, the information came in that the, uh, budget, uh, the budget division uh, that there is a freeze on that a specific pot of money. I don't know whether that's the only one, or I don't know whether there will be other freeze uh, for money that has been basically uh, promised to our non-for-profit or to our organizations. Um, the other piece is, will something like this be done in Spanish or at least translated for a Spanish speaker listener? And lastly, it is true that we had telehealth medicine but one of the biggest issues that I have, that I personally witnessed was with seniors who are homebound and having now to go into telemedicine when they do not know how to set up uh, because either their computer or whatever is obsolete. Nevertheless, even not even having the, uh, the tools to be able to receive that telemedicine that we so are capitalizing and all that. So those are my question. And again, thank you for doing this. Uh, I know that it's a hard time, but I think that the best thing is communication and basically working together. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alfredo. Um, there's a lot there. I, I hope I, I got it all, but if I missed something, I'm sorry. Um, the $100 million um, that the governor just announced on Friday in small business loans, um, one of the focuses is minority businesses. So as long as they fit the criteria of less than 20 employees and less than 3 million in revenue, um, minority businesses are a focus of that loan program. Um, the telehealth is, is a challenge. You know, we spoke about that a little bit when we were talking about behavioral health, but telehealth also works for um, addressing, you know, other health issues. And, and you're right, that's an expense that is um, challenging on the infrastructure side because many seniors, their computer may be obsolete. They may not have a computer. They don't have a smartphone. Um, so the investments that the healthcare providers are making, um, we need to, and I know on the OASIS side upstate, there have been grants for uh, specifically that, to get the, the, the technology in the hands of the people who need it and, and to, to reimburse the agencies we're doing that, but that's a challenge that we need to keep up with. And then finally, the um, the essential workers and the, and the mental health um, component, the behavioral health, the emotional wellness of the essential workers. Um, I know the governor has set up um, a hotline for essential workers. Um, I don't know that I, I have that right offhand. We do have the number for the emotional support hotline, but we will get you there was one set up specifically for the medical community, but the emotional support hotline is 844-863-9314. And then there was one number I forgot to give at the beginning um, that relates to behavioral health, that this has exacerbated, being quarantined together has exacerbated um, domestic violence. And when people are home with their abuser, they just can't pick up the phone and call for help. So the state has set up a text line um, for victims of domestic violence that you can text silently so your abuser will not hear. This is very important. 844-997-2121. And, and you can text that number um, if you're if you're in trouble and you will get assistance. Um, and I just want to take a break and just say we've been joined by uh, Assemblyman Tom Abenanti. Um, Tom, if you'd like to say hello and say a word. I know Tom's never a man for oh, for just one <laughs> word. But Tom, you here? Hi, Peter. Yes, thank you. You're right. I will never pass up an opportunity to say hello. Uh, I'm very pleased to join you this morning. I am impressed. You've got so many people up at this time of the day on a Saturday, and you're not even giving away free coffee. You got to bring, yeah, you have to bring your own coffee. I've got, <laughs> so I, I think this is great. You're keeping up with the community. I commend you for that. Um, uh, secondly, um, I, I got to tell you, I, I want to give everybody a testimonial. It has been great working with you. Thank your you. Your experience in government uh, before being a senator, okay? Uh, has has served you so well. At a time like this, we really need to have people in government who know what they're doing. This is not a time for beginners. This is not a time for people to come back from the past. We need people who know what's going on now. And and I got to tell you, your office is doing a great job. And, and I don't think, you know, we hear, when are you going back to work? Well, I got to tell you guys, we've been working. I know your office is like my office, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, yeah. the phone calls go into somebody's private cell phone because we're not in the offices, right? And over dinner, my staff is getting phone calls just like yours, trying to help people get unemployment insurance. You and I are on the governor's conference call every day and we're trading stories about, you know, well, one day you talk about unemployment insurance and I talk about motor vehicle. The next day you talk about motor vehicle and I talk about unemployment insurance. We're trying to make the system work for the people who are in our districts. And your office and you were doing a great job. I got to commend you on that. I noticed somebody mentioned um, earlier, and thank you for mentioning me, uh, kids with special needs uh, and adults with special needs. Uh, they are all vulnerable people, whether they're seniors, 
whether they're people with uh, some kind of a disability, uh, whether they're kids who are just slipping through the cracks, really have to get our attention. Uh, we can't let this go on without finding a way to, to bring them back because they don't understand what's going on and it's hard for them to do something with a computer. So this, we, we can't let the challenge overwhelm us. We have to see this as an opportunity and we have to, we have to move forward. And I know you and you, our offices have talked about this. You and I are going to have to talk about this as we start to get back into session and we start to work on these things with, you know, we have passed the crisis. We're now to a point where we can start to, to deal with some of these other issues. Uh, my last comment is like you said, stay safe. There was something on the internet that I repeat all the time. Just because the parachute has slowed your descent doesn't mean you can take it off. We're not back on the ground yet. We're getting there, but we all have to be very careful. So Pete, thanks for doing what you're doing here. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with you. We've got a lot of work to do ahead of us. Um, and together we're gonna, and with all of the people uh, here this morning and all of our other constituents, we'll make it through. We've got a very strong group of people in Westchester County and Putnam County. We'll make, we're gonna make it through, but it's, it is a challenge. But we'll, we'll, we'll get through. At the end of this, we'll be stronger than we were when we started. So thank you for your service. Thank, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to work with you. Your office is fabulous. And, and for those of you who don't know, Tom and I actually go back to the, the Westchester County Board of Legislators together. So we've, we've been working together for a long time. Um, so we, we are, I see we're over time, but we've got four more questions. Um, so maybe we can do this like a lightning round. So Ben, let's call on each of the four people. And, and if you can ask your question real quickly, I'll, I'll answer it as quickly as I can. And then that way we can get through the last four. From after 30 seconds, so kidding, kidding. Uh, Jack and Terry. Um, one sec. One sec. The question I have involves HOAs and our amenities as we go through this reopening phase. We have five pools. We've had per permit applications in with the Westchester County, as we should. Uh, they've been in since the beginning of the year. We have yet to been able to get any feedback from Westchester County regarding the issuance of pool permits. No, we're not ready to just go and open our pools to our community. Uh, to prepare five <clears throat> pools for opening, when and if we do get clearance, is a very laborious and very expensive prospect. So is there any guidance on when the county will make that decision regarding this year? You know, the, the, it goes back to the point that someone made earlier about getting guidance for the other phases. Um, you know, pools, I believe, fall in phase four, and we've only received guidance for phase one. Um, and that comes from the state. And then because this is a county health department issue, then they have their issue. Excuse me, I've got a wasp walking on my desk. Um, <laughs> we, uh, um, we can look into that for you. If you can send us um, just a little bit of information and who you've spoken with, we can, we can call George Latimer about that. Um, next up, uh, John M. Mute there. Yes. Yes. Can we hear you? Hi, Senator. Thanks for doing this. My question uh, is regarding rent and more specifically commercial rent. The PPP is only supposed to be used for about 25% of expenses and uh, landlords are demanding payment of rent at the end of the crisis. And if, uh, if tenants, commercial tenants specifically, are forced to pay their rent at the end of this crisis, there are going to be a lot of businesses going out and uh, a lot of subsequent unemployment because of that. I know there's some legislation moving now. Can you update us on, on whether or not any rent can be moved to the end of the lease or, uh, any, for, or any forgiveness on rentals based on the fact that uh, the landlords are playing, paying close to 0% interest right now in the money they're borrowing? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I know in the Senate, and uh, we have a task force on, on rent issues, not just on the residential side, but on the commercial side. Um, and, and the Senate and the Assembly have been negotiating. 
and and I'm not exactly sure what the outcome of that package is going to be, but this issue is definitely on the radar. Excuse me again, I've got a wasp here who seems to really like me. Um, so so um, if you can uh, uh, send us your contact information, I will probably have a better idea Tuesday when we go back into conference just exactly what the package is that will be advanced. And I can let you know probably probably Tuesday or Wednesday. All right, final question. Uh, Jacqueline, please. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Jacqueline Baker. I'm a Yorktown resident. I'm also hi, Jacqueline. Good to see you again. Yes, hi. I work with the nonprofits for sickle cell disease. But my question is, in addition to the unemployment that um, everyone is still, you know, waiting families, will you, do you think there'll be a second stimulus um, check that they're talking about? I know it's, you know, in Washington, but, you know, to help families out all over, would there still, would there be another stimulus check or? Well, what I understand was that there is more stimulus for families in the House of Representatives bill. Um, we'll have to see what's in the Senate bill and what they reconcile. Um, I think the Senate is talking about something more limited. Um, the House bill was very expansive. Um, so we, we will monitor that with our federal partners. And, and, you know, if we hear something, we'll let you know. The Senate is currently on recess, which is disappointing um, that they went in recess when, when people are hurting. Um, but as soon as they come back, let's hope they take up another package because we know our, our small businesses are hurting, our, our residents are hurting, uh, and, and certainly um, local governments and state governments need assistance. All right. So thank you all so much. This has been a great conversation. Um, our phone number and our email are in the chat and will be posted later. Um, if you had a question we didn't get to, I apologize. But once again, please stay safe, wear your masks. Um, the governor did say that gatherings of fewer than 10 are now okay. So if you wanna get together with your family for a barbecue or something uh, over the holidays, it's, it's now okay. But please mask up and stay safe. Thank you, God bless.